All right, what's up, guys? I've got Dylan here, my co-founder at Stacks. Uh, we're gonna keep diving into some topics, and we're gonna try to keep doing these each week. Um, just basically giving you guys context as business owners, um, not only the importance of the finance side of your business, why it's so important, um, and also just riff on some stuff, you know, because we deal with about forty clients right now, and. Each one of them has interesting stuff going on in the day to day. So it's always good to share some insights as to what's going on. Uh, so Dylan, what's up, man? Absolutely. Yeah. Good morning, man. Let's get after it. All right. So I got a few questions here. I'll start with the first one. Uh, we definitely see the benefit of a fractional approach for what we do. Um, and I think that translates to a lot of just bottom line value for for, for clients and just re really any business that's growing, um, especially when it comes to whether they bring somebody in house or they're paying somebody as a contractor, um, getting a service provider, what does it look like on the cost side? So if you could explain the math of how a fractional CFO is actually more beneficial uh, from a cost perspective and less expensive than hiring, you know, for an in-house, role, whether it's a CFO, accountant, typically, you know, we're providing a whole team um, with our engagements. So kind of walk through the math of that and why it's sometimes very valuable for, for companies. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, hiring an accounting professional in-house, you know, that you're definitely looking at $100,000 per year, even more than that sometimes expense um, to get somebody that's pretty solid and knows what they're doing. And on the CFO side, if you were hiring like a true CFO to be in there full time, that number goes up quite dramatically as well to have a full-time CFO in there. Um, you know, to have someone that was maybe a controller and a CFO in your business, I mean, you're definitely looking at, you know, 250K, 300K plus per year um, to have that in your business. But the overwhelming majority of businesses don't need people full-time in their business like that. I mean, unless you were like a seriously massive business, um, you're honestly probably better off with a fractional solution. Um, you know, kind of our value prop, like Alex said, we kind of plug in a full team of people into people's businesses. It's kind of like a fractional accounting and finance department where they're getting staff accountant, senior accountant, CFO, tax accountant. So like in our case, like we can basically plug four accounting professionals into your business for less than the cost of hiring one, any one of those individuals, you know, full time inside of your business. So, you know, essentially... You know, you're able to get the same type of benefits and knowledge with a fractional CFO um, for much, much less of the cost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know one of our clients, they're doing about 12, 15 million per year. And um, even though it's not on paper full time, it requires they have a lot of moving parts and it requires almost a, you know, a full time commitment. Um, not every week, but you can be surprised about the amount of hours that get invested um, just handling the accounts receivable, paying contractors, especially if there's large sales teams, they have their own terms and uh, and ways that they get paid and has to make sure that that matches the, the company's policy in terms of how we invoice, uh, excuse me, how the contractor or salesperson invoices the company. There's got to be a process to reconcile what they're sending us as to what they closed for the month, what the payment terms are, where the cutoff dates are for what are we including in, in this invoice? Is the percentage equaling what you know the terms are? Um, all that requires a process. Um, same with compliance. Same with making sure that sales tax is taken care of, making sure that um, you're, you know, in the state that you're registered in for the entity, all these things have requirements that um, recur on whether it's a monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. Um, so being able to leverage a fractional team, you still get that high touch care without a lot of the costs that come with it. Uh, and like you were saying, totally. I mean, a, a good CFO, a CPA. Look, I started my public accounting career back in 20. 15 and I was starting at like 60,000 a year. Um, I think a lot of our, a, a lot of the businesses that are 
um, off the ground, you know, they're, they're typically doing over like a hundred thousand a month. You're, if you're trying to hire an in-house accountant nowadays, you're not, you're not going to be able to get away with paying forty, fifty thousand dollars a year for an in-house accountant. You're probably looking around sixty thousand um, dollars, and I think for us, we're able to have a multiplier effect on that value by not only uh, being competitive in in pricing, but also having more people um, being able to touch the day-to-day activities um, to where sometimes you'll save a factor of two or three versus hiring a CFO. A true CFO in house that will cost you maybe one hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand, and depending on the size of the business, absolutely it could be more. Um, for sure, yeah. The other piece of it too is that I talk about is when you hire someone in house, you're always at risk for them job hopping or leaving. And oft, oftentimes, you get people that leave, you know, public accounting to go to industry accounting, and they do that to get a pay raise, not to go down in pay, right? So. You know, 60,000 is honestly probably even a generous number. Like, I, I really think you're probably getting closer to 80, 90, 100 um, to get someone that is a CPA and like could actually provide value to your business versus you trying to teach them every last bit of what your business does um, for sure. And that's where it's kind of like, and the other piece of that too is like that person likely doesn't have a ton of experience if you are getting them at 60, 70K a year. So sure, they can maybe do the bookkeeping and help send invoices, but they're not going to have the skill set to actually take your accounting data and put it into something more forward looking like forecasts or budgeting or helping you, you know, with working capital considerations and things of that nature. Yeah, agreed. And on that note, we've had a lot of clients ask for forecasting. Um, and I think it's good to be able to kind of explain to viewers, you know, one, of course, you're going to get the analysis with the financial performance for the month, looking at things comparatively, but that's one thing there's a, there's profit and there's cash, right? So in terms of planning ahead, and you know, this well, when we're, we're talking to, um, prospective clients, you know, a lot of times they're coming to us saying we can do the bookkeeping. Like that's, you know, <clears throat> we handle that. That's fine. But it's like bookkeeping is, backwards looking the CFO level insights and the actual actionable insights to have decision-making um, capabilities is forward looking. And within that is forecasting. So um, explain why forecasting is um, how we do it first of all, but, but why are they really important for clients, especially when it comes to, you know, um, a company that's experiencing growth. Yeah, it's super important. I mean, cash flow is everything. I think there's, there's a stat out there that I think it's like 82% of businesses fail due to cash flow issues, not profitability issues. So it's possible to have a profitable business like on the income statement and still just be like out of cash at the end of the year, not have enough cash to pay your taxes, not have enough cash to pay your employees bonuses, whatever it might be. So it's really all comes back to a cash flow thing, making sure we're efficiently deploying and collecting the cash, right? So as far as forecasting, you know, we have a software that plugs into QuickBooks, pulls all that data. I mean, then we kind of manipulate it from there based on, you know, the different variables and different considerations where it can really help, you know, a couple of different things, like a few different things come to mind, like, okay, say, Hey, we want to start running paid ads for the first time. Hey, we're expecting to spend, you know, 6k per month. And we're expecting a ROAS of, you know, 1.2 for the first few months, but we expect to get that you know, above two after six months, how does, what kind of effect does that have on the financials? Well, okay, we can actually model that out across six months, 12 months, that sort of thing. Um, the other really relevant one that I see for a lot of our clients is with hiring considerations. You know, they want to say, okay, I want to hire, you know, a chief of staff, or I want to hire a, you know, a chief operating officer, maybe they want to hire a client success rep, whatever it might be. And it's like, okay, I know that I need to pay this person at least 5k a month, how does that affect our financials? And do we expect that that will increase our capacity to maybe bring in more revenue by having this person in the business? And it's just being able to model all of that out. Um, and then on the cost side of things, you know, maybe there's big expenses coming up. Maybe you're factoring in for taxes. Maybe you're factoring in for, you know, whatever your industry is. Maybe if you're in, in e-com, you have to buy, you know, large amounts of inventory at one time. So it's just making sure that you're able to pay what you need to pay without putting yourself in a really bad spot. 
I mean, then also helping make sure you collect cash efficiently. So those are a few ways that a forecast can really give you some forward looking insights into what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all those insights will affect the decision making. Like you mentioned inventory. Um, if the end result of what we're forecasting paints a picture of, okay, we're actually going to be a little bit lighter on cash than we thought even though we're trying to buy this by, you know, 10,000 units of, of our product and be able to facilitate that. Um, how does that then affect how we go about it? Maybe based on that forecast, we're going to consider uh, purchasing that inventory in a different way than just sending out cash. Maybe it's putting it on credit. Maybe it's, maybe it's drawing down on one of our lines of credit from, from a bank. Maybe it's utilizing a credit card that has a 0% interest for 12 months and that extends our float. We can pay it down over time. Um, and again, or negotiating just, terms with the vendor, negotiating yeah. terms, you know, oftentimes it's like you spend 20% of that inventory purchase up front, um, just like a house payment, right? You put 20% up front. Okay. It goes into production. And then once it's ready to ship out, you pay the remaining 80%. Okay. We know that there's costs associated with, with once that production's finished, if it's manufactured in China, you've got to get licenses, you've got to get um, visas, maybe not visas, but I know there's, when a, when I had a prior company, we were manufacturing products and we had to pay for not only just the shipping, right? Like we had to track the the actual costs of containers and that was like a kind of more of a macro um effect going on with pricing this was during covid uh you've got to plan for what the cost of that shipment's going to be um all the fees to get things through customs and all that stuff that's going to affect your cash as well right so thinking through how we're going to go about this next inventory cycle um if you're an e-com business all that stuff's important um for sure yeah, yep. and one more thing too on like the forecasting. The other piece you can forecast out is maybe you have like three different service lines um, with three different cost of services and three different profitability levels. And you could kind of see, you could kind of model out, hey, if we went all in on selling just this one service more than the other two, well, what does that look like over six months or 12 months? Or hey, if we eliminate this service that we've been doing and just go all in on these two, what does that look like over 12 months? If we evenly, you know, sell all three of these across the next 12 months. What does that look like? Um, because a lot of times people offer multiple services when there's really one or two big winners and the rest they kind of do just to do it. Um, so sometimes it can help, you know, show where the winners are and where you should be doubling down as far as what services you're selling or what products. Yeah. And, and even not just on the expenditure side, but also the growth, right? If you're forecasting a certain percentage of growth, that's going to affect how much cash you bring in. What also is going to take effect is, you know, do you know how long it takes customers to pay their invoices? Do you know how long it takes or how long you have to be able to pay a bill to your vendors? Um, I think a lot of, it, you know, agencies, smaller agencies, like a lot of it's software. So, okay, that's just hitting the card every month. Great. That's easy predictability. Um, but once you start growing, you're going to have, more clients that have different ways of how they prefer to pay you. And you kind of have to have that balance between um, not only how we would like to have clients pay, but balance that with them. Right. So if, you know, you have 200 clients, 50 of them might decide to send checks or pay you externally through an ACH. And now you've got to factor in the days that it takes to collect on that money. That's all affecting your cash flow. So all these different inputs will affect um, your cash positions based on your growth, based on how customers pay you, paying your vendors, um, your expenses, future pacing things uh, for growth objectives and trying to reverse engineer those. Um, I think forecasting is definitely like something that gets, it doesn't get touched on enough, but I think a lot of business owners and it's super important. And, and I love that for us, we're able to utilize a lot of tech that um, streamlines that process and does it in a very like visually digestible way. For sure. Um, and so the other, the other piece, once all that's 
taken care of, right? The year's kind of done. Um, maybe touch on our, on our tax focus for clients. Um, what does it mean to have a tax, you know, have the financials ready for the business, but also making sure that they're ready for tax purposes. I think that's something that's typically lost on, on clients. Cause we've had clients that come in and ask for, Hey, could we file on, on cash, but do our books in accrual? Um, typically accrual, you're going to show more net income than a cash position. Cause it's actually when the cash hits the bank account versus when the invoice goes out and the revenue is recognized. Um, maybe touch on that and what it means to really have like tax ready financials. Yeah. So our, you know, as you know, our whole mindset with the tax side of things is just trying to be super proactive, right? We don't want any surprises come tax time. We want to have a, you should have, we want to have our clients. We want to make sure our clients have a really good idea of what their tax return is going to look like well before it's actually filed, right? Like we, our whole goal is when we're filing a tax return, you shouldn't be finding out how much you owe in that moment right at the deadline. And that's what we try our best to avoid. You know, ideally, you know, around December, you know, the clients have a pretty good idea of what they're going to owe. I um, mean, it gives them a few more months to kind of prepare to make payments or whatever it might be. As far as the financial statements, yeah, this is something, you know, I've talked about quite a bit. Um, is just the difference between financial statements that are beneficial for business decision making and financials that are good enough for a tax return, right? So as far as good enough for a tax return, the buckets you put something in as far as your bookkeeping on your financial statements, it doesn't really matter a whole ton. Like the IRS really cares mostly about, okay, how much money did you make at the end of the day, right? And did you pay your tax on it? So say you're paying paid ads and there's, you know, advertising on the income statement for tax purposes. That's great for business decision making. You might want to see it broken out is, okay, what's my Google ad spend, my meta ad spend and whatever else. So that's where it's like business decision making. You might want to split out a little bit more so you can maybe get a little more granular and see um, the metrics that you need to. From a tax perspective, it doesn't need to be broken out quite as in depth. Um, but the other piece is like, you know, financial statements that are in a good spot for business decision making are also good enough for a tax return, whereas the opposite isn't always true, right? You can have financials that are tax ready, but really aren't going to give you much insight into, you know, making business decisions. And when you go to file the tax return, one of the things that causes a bunch of stress for business owners, because there's a lot of tax firms out there that really won't do the bookkeeping. So the tax preparer will tell you, hey, you need to go do all your transactions and give me a profit and loss. So then you have the business owner just two, three days straight trying to wheel and deal and make a P&L and a balance sheet out of thin air, which just causes an immense amount of stress, right? Like tax season in general already is a huge stress for most of the population. And then just throwing that on top of um, their plate is just, it's just a lot. So the other side of just having these ready to go is just the peace of mind, the freed up mental real estate, um, is just really dramatic having someone just handle this for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, I mean, don't even get me started on balance sheets. I think most business owners, if they come to us and say, Hey, yeah, can you file our taxes? Sure. Are the books done? Uh, I have bank statements. It's like, no, we need actual <laughs> financials. And if you're making over a certain amount in revenue, you've got to be able to report a balance sheet as well. Um, so tax ready is, is more than just, okay, do I have a PL? Um, it's actually much more detailed and involved, especially if you're depending on your entity structure, you've got to be tracking your basis as an owner, whether, you know, does your, do, do your retain earnings at the end of the year balance to what the beginning retain earnings are of the next year? Um, does your shareholder basis, is there a calculation done there, making sure that that's tracked and tracked accurately? Um, there's book to tax adjustments. You know, there's a lot of things that happen after you have the financials, which like you said, it's important to have the business decisions uh, and have it, you know, t have the financials tailored for, you know, operational decisions. But from a tax perspective, um, it surprisingly can get messy quick. And I think that's one of the reasons why we preach the, like you were saying, you know, 
guiding them throughout the year and having visibility into, okay, if the year ended today, what would our tax liability be? If we're forecasting 30% growth through the end of the year, what is our expected tax liability going to be? Can we set aside a certain amount of funds in a holding account, another bank account that's specifically just earmarked for taxes so that there's no surprises at the end of the, at, you know, come April or March, February, depending on the entity, when you file, there's also those requirements. Um, are, do we have enough in the bank to basically take care of this? Are we going to pay, are we going to pay quarterly? Um, is my owner's comp, if I'm an S corp, making sense with the ratio of distributions versus W2 income? There's a whole lot of things that take into consideration when it comes to taxes that um, I think it's lost on a lot of business owners that are just starting out. But um, that's why it's just so important. Like, And it kind of goes back to what you were saying about the fractional CFO side. If you pay somebody $60,000, $70,000 in-house as an accountant, that's great. But are, are they going to know how to actually guide you throughout the year on the tax side? And also, are you positioning things and tracking things with regards to what you pay yourself as an owner, what you take off the table as a distribution versus W-2? Um, that's all happening throughout the year. So yeah, there's a lot of considerations there. And I think, um, you know, tax is just that necessary evil that um, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm glad we've been putting so much focus on having like, you know, a real like concierge throughout the year. We're checking in, we're having quarterly calls, um, giving you visibility and oftentimes just educating our clients on the importance of all these things. Um, and as you grow, sure. it, just, it just becomes like a necessary requirement. So for sure. Um, yeah, I, I like that one. Tax, tax is a beast, but, um, you know, thankfully you can leverage a company like Stacks. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you mentioned kind of going back to hiring someone in house, you would be really, really, you'd have a very difficult time finding someone in house that could really do everything end to end as far as the bookkeeping the compliance, yeah. the tax planning, the tax return, the CFO level insights, the forecasting, like there's just not a lot of people. Like if you need someone in house, that can do the bookkeeping and, you know, send invoices. Sure. You can find that. Um, but even still like the, it just doesn't, it's just not a trade that makes sense for most businesses where you could leverage someone like us or, a, you know, another firm similar to us, whatever it might be where we can do all those things. And it's less than what you're going to pay someone in house. For sure. Yeah. That outsource overseas bookkeeper is going to put things in buckets, but it's not going to be forward looking and it's not going to protect you come tax time. I've just seen that time and time again. Um, as you're For growing, sure. yeah, focus on the money, get your revenue up. All that's great. Pay somebody $200 a month to just take care of the bookkeeping. Sure. But there's a whole lot of actionable, offensive um, decision making that really becomes important and honestly just becomes a requirement over time That's for sure and you know the quarterly calls that we do with our clients just it's such a help you know quarterly calls for tax specifically we do other calls with them but for tax specifically we like to hop on once per quarter and the whole function there is just to make sure there's no surprises and we all know exactly what is going on throughout the year because even some of our current clients have made you know very poor decisions throughout the year without telling us and it just makes you want to pull your hair out. It's like, dude, it's why you're paying us. Like literally ask us questions. If you're going to drop a hundred thousand dollars on an investment or something, you know, like that can have a material effect. Um, we've had a lot of people who have spent large sums of money thinking that it was going to be deductible and write off in the, at the end of the year. And then when we go to file, yeah. it's, it's just not right. And it's like, this could have all been avoided with literally one conversation, one Slack message, one zoom call, and this could have just all been avoided. Right. So that's why if we're doing tax, we definitely mandate those quarterly calls um, to try and mitigate that the best we can and just make sure people are being put in the best tax position possible for them that aligns with their goals. Right. And I say, you know, that aligns with their goals. And this is something, you know, I've, I've talked about at length at this point, but you know, I get on a lot of sales calls. I do all the sales calls for us here. And, you know, you come across people that are just obsessed with paying zero tax. And it's just like, they're all their end goal for everything. And it's like, Bro, that's just not always the most advantageous position for you to be in, 
It's just not depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to exit your business eventually, and you're just trying to have zero tax and you show that your business makes no money, you're not going to have much enterprise value. You're not going to have a great multiple if the business on paper makes no money every year from a tax perspective. And then same thing, if you ever want to borrow to maybe buy a business someday, or maybe you want to purchase a house or a car, whatever it might be, right? If you show zero income every single year, nobody's going to lend you anything. So I really like the saying that, you know, paying your taxes is buying your borrowing power with the banks, essentially. Yeah, my, our family accountant for years was doing my taxes and um, he said something that, that stuck out to me and, and he basically said something along the lines of the way you build wealth is by paying taxes. And I definitely know there's truth to it. Of course, the exceptions are, you know, like the Bezos of the world who all their wealth is tied up in their debt or their, their equity and their stocks. And they're, they're drawing down loans based on the value of their stock. Okay. If you're Jeff Bezos, great. You can get away with being insanely rich and pay basically no taxes. That's one in a billion people. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's true. It's true. Especially if you want to buy a house, like you were saying, you want to present financials to investors. You want to be able to position the company for growth for an exit. You want to be showing more profit and the growth, uh, you know, in, in a company that's grown over time. So all good stuff. I think this was, this was super helpful. We're going to keep doing these every week. I think Dylan, I'm down for, for these each week. Um, yeah, it's been good. And if, if you watch these all the way and you have certain topics, you have questions on, definitely feel free to shoot them over to us and we'll touch on them next time. Yeah. Check out our website, stacks.pro. Um, and uh, follow us on Twitter, on YouTube. We'll, we'll probably throw these up both on there and we'll catch you next week. Good team.